This again showing God's power through Jesus Christ. Power over distance, power over space. God is not limited to how close he is in the proximity. That instant healing that takes place. <clears throat> the third of these examples <clears throat> found in chapter 5. So it continues here. Chapter 5, we see the healing of a sick man. Quite a few of these dealing with healing, not all of them. John chapter 5 and verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. John's account, you'll see more and more of the feast of the Jews. Remember, it's 20, 30 years after, and more and more perversions of the Jews creating them their own feast. They were already keeping Passover on the wrong day, keeping Pentecost on a set day instead of counting 50. Certain things that were not God's ways, he delineates. There's the Jews. It doesn't mean you don't keep the feast. It just means you don't keep the Jews' versions of the feast. They were perverting them already. And so we see the time period after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and G Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep's gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Beth Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. You think about this great multitude who is waiting for something to take place that God did not say is how you're healed. Interesting, all these people and only one is selected by Christ. They're waiting for the moving of the water. We've gone through this several years ago, this example alone. Verse 4, for an angel, this word not necessarily an actual angel, it can also be translated messenger, but again, traditions or superstitions get created. Oh, I saw the water move. The first person that stepped in, they were healed. Is that how God heals people? So when you look in the Bible and you see it doesn't add up to what the Bible shows, well then, is this a tradition? Is there demons involved? Is there, a, let's say it's a true angel, if it is an actual angel or not, but here's this flock of individuals, this great multitude sick, waiting for water to move. And it's the first one to jump in. So we see from Christ's example, he doesn't, well, let me hold everyone back and let you get in the water and you'll be healed. We see what actually happens. <clears throat> and so it, uh, it says the stirring of the water, middle of verse 4, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Here's this individual for 38 years. This would have been before Christ was born. I wonder, did the Father and the Word who had become Jesus Christ talk about this before? All right, here's this individual. Here's what will be done. Here's he was infirm for 38 years. And the superstitions of, well, whoever gets in first will be healed. It doesn't say it actually, they were actually were healed. When we think of these superstitions that were there, Christ doesn't address it at all. He just does what God instructs. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered, it's interesting, he doesn't say yes or no. He says, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Almost every single instruction that Christ gives of a miracle, a sign that takes place, it always comes with directions. It wasn't just a simple thing. There was always something, even if it's a simple stand up, take your bed, and walk. This man had been infirm for 38 years. Christ does not say, and make sure you're working on your physical therapy every week because it's going to take time for these muscles to get their movement again. You start thinking about the muscle starting to work perfectly. The healing that takes place instantly. Rise, take your bed, 
and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? Here's the attitude we see over and over with the majority of the Jews. Should have been, this guy's been sick for 38 years, hasn't been able to walk, hasn't been able, and he's been healed. Wow, this is awesome. Instead, who can we accuse? First of all, it was done on the Sabbath. That was illegal by their man-made traditions, not by God's law. And secondly, we see here, their first beef is with the individual, saying it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. This man was not moving his possessions and moving apartments on the Sabbath and working. He was doing, he was at one place, probably already had the bed there before sunset and was waiting, Christ telling him, take your bed home and walk. This was not working, it was being healed. You think about this miracle and they get wrapped up in their man-made traditions. Verse 11, he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. So, first thing he does is, Well, this other guy told me to do it, so I'm just following what he tells me. Didn't know who it was. Again, shows you Christ was a, Don't forget, I'm a son of God. I'm the son of God. Look at me. I'm important. He didn't even know who he was. Verse 12, then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Three times this phrase is used here, and the same phrase, take up your bed and walk. But the one, verse 13, who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. This huge crowd again, Christ removes himself from the area. You wonder, this great multitude, waiting for waters to stir, here comes Christ, heals an individual. How many other? Oh, heal me. He only heals one. Verse 14, afterwards, Jesus found him, the man that was healed, in the temple, and said to him, see, you have been made well. So there's another issue with this healed man. Sin no more, lest a worse Thing come upon you. Over and over in scriptures, the reminder comes, God tells us one time. You see Korah's rebellion. You don't see people who rebel and go off on their own. You see the earth open up and they get eaten up. God shows, here's what he thinks of those who will try to go against that authority. We think of here, Christ didn't go through and talk to every single person at this pool he says, go and sin no more. You shouldn't have been there doing this to begin with. It's not how you're going to be healed is this instruction. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. This reminder of Christ, repent. Do what's right. Do what God's word shows. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. This individual that again is healed of this third example, this healing of the sick man. We see again God's power through Christ and this power over time, this power over time. 38 years this individual was afflicted. Instantly he's healed. And this healing, this power over time, well, you know, if you've just been sick for a couple years, God can heal it. But, you know, 30, 38 years, that's too long. No. Sometimes we can wonder in our life, you know, what? Well, why do I deal with this sickness or this infirmity for this many years? Or what about a week, or two months, or a year, two years? God's power over time, we'll see over and over. The fourth of these is found here in chapter 6. <clears throat> the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000. Here in chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over 
the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased or sick, other translations have. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now that a Passover, a f the feast of the Jews, was near. So here we're close to the spring holy days. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test Philip, uh, for he himself knew what he would do. Christ knew exactly what was going to take place. You see the other accounts as well. Uh, this emphasis wasn't here. Here's food. Let's see if we can get a big following of people to look at us. You see in the other accounts we see him preaching the gospel, repent, going through a sermon and mighty, mighty words in a sermon to give them. And then as they're getting ready to leave, well, we need to feed them so they don't collapse on the way home. They're not too fatigued and his care for them. Here is this great multitude came. He wants to test Philip. Well, what do you think? How are we going to feed them? Let's see, well, was he getting it yet? Verse 7, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Christ was not wanting them to have a little bit. I love this. I love all the miracles. They're just awesome to read through. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? You know, here's what we have, five loaves of barley and two small fish. The other uh, disciple, uh, Philip, said, Well, we've got money, but we don't have enough to feed this. Christ, well, you know, we'll, we'll multiply the money and we'll buy enough. No, he goes with the one. Well, we'll take these five loaves and two fish. And he gives, again, very specific instructions. Verse 10, Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the man, men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, again, gave thanks to God for what God had provided, he gave thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Think about seconds, thirds, fourths, however, oh no, no, we only got enough for one round. Whatever anyone needed, they would come back and we had enough, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. It's going to be another example, lesson for them. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. You start with five loaves of bread and you get 12 baskets left. 12 baskets, not, not well, five baskets, okay, I can see a little bit of a multiplication. 12 baskets full of the fragments of leftover. You start to see many lessons here. You think, are you ever going to outgive God? This is another one I would love to see the video for. What was it like? Were you pulling the bread and it just kept expanding, just kept coming, and just, uh, just kept multiplying? You just kept pulling it and giving it out. And you get 12 baskets of leftovers. You can never outgive God. Here we see as this miracle takes place, and them seeing what took place. <clears throat> Verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. This quote that comes from Deuteronomy 18, you can hold your place here. <clears throat> Turn back to Deuteronomy 18, one of the most quoted verses in the New Testament. Still, we're going back to add them up. Still on my list to do. 
But this one occurs quite a few times. John chapter 6, you see this mighty miracle feeding 5,000 and not just feeding them so they got a little bit to eat. You, you got them stuffed. You think they're full and you got 12 baskets left over. This is not a, a magician's trick. This is a miracle from God. We see in verse, <clears throat> uh, chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, verses 15 through 18, this quote that comes, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the prophet they were looking for. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst. We see the Lord your God here being a reference to the Father. Christ did not raise up himself as a prophet. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, capital P. He raised up Jesus Christ, like me, Moses here, referenced here, from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desire to the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of assembly saying, Let us not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. Reference back to Exodus 19, as you think of God coming down and all the miracles that took place, it's thundering, and saying, oh, we don't want to hear it anymore. Verse 17, And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet, in capital P, like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them as uh, them all that I command him. Jesus Christ was the perfect messenger of God. Not a single word fell to the ground that the Father gave him. He was the capital P prophet. Other prophets were given from God. Here's the reference to the true prophet, the, the capital P prophet. And this reference, they were looking for this individual. And you think here we get to this fifth one that's listed here in John, and them seeing this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the one. Let alone all the words that were spoken were not probably the most popular. You know, the people of the day were, you know, peace, peace when there was no peace. And here was this man who was preaching God's word and expounding it and repent and turn to God. None of those words fell to the ground. Exactly what the Father gave Jesus Christ were given. We see this feeding of the 5,000. When you think of the power, the power over quantity. The power over quantity see that bread and, and fish just keep multiplying to keep coming out uh, the power over quantity you think of God's power again through Jesus Christ we then get to the fifth one <clears throat> here in chapter 6 following this portion pretty quick we'll read verse 15 as it leads into verse 16 John 6 verse 15 therefore when Jesus perceived that there they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to a mountain by himself alone. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, went over the sea towards Capernaum, and it was dark, and Jesus had not come to them. So here they're in this Sea of Galilee, as it says in verse 1. Isn't it a huge sea, if you've ever been there? Verse 18, then the sea arose, became a great wind, uh, because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, this rowing, you think of this great wind, if you've ever been in a canoe against great winds and you just keep rowing, you, you may not get very far, but you've gone three or four miles and you may have only gone half a mile. Start looking at their exhaustion, whether they actually covered this three to four is the mention of how much they were rowing and trying to get out of this high winds and get to shore. They're rowing and they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. 
gone through some of these with Peter's uh, sermons that we went through. And this reminder here, I do not blame them one bit. You're rowing in high winds. Are you really expecting someone to be walking in the water? You see it happen at least twice, maybe three times in other accounts. Uh, this isn't the only one. Uh, but if this was the first one, you think, well, they're afraid. I love how he immediately calms them in verse 20. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. This account shows this walking on the water. Jesus Christ walking on the water. And not only that, I love how he gets in the boat and they're immediately at land. You talk about, wait a second, we're still out in the middle of this sea and all of a sudden now we're right in the land. Is this end of verse 21, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. It wasn't even in a different location. It's exactly the destination they were trying to get to. You think of this walking on water and this boat being moved quickly, instantly to land. This power over natural law. This power over natural law. Who walks on water? The water did not change to ice. It didn't well, it somehow change. We think of God performing this miracle through Jesus Christ. This power of what God has over natural law. What, humanly speaking, we think, well, that doesn't make sense. I think in our life, again, do we limit God? Well, you know, God could do this, but I don't think he could do fill in the blank. We limit God at times. This fifth example, again, of walking on water, power over natural law. Leads us up the sixth one. If you turn to John chapter 9, <clears throat> I love the remainder of chapter 6, still one of my favorite verses where Christ says, does this offend you? After he gives instruction. You then get into the last great day in chapter 7 end of chapter 7 and in chapter 8 still the last great day and into chapter 9 is the last great day a lot of instruction that's given as we limit the last great day because we think well we just show up for one two services and head home and you think about them wanting to be there all day long so you picture them being the way it fell this year is the same way it fell there on the Sabbath so Friday at sunset the beginning of the last great day wow Go to the temple, let's learn more. Christ teaching. And then you get through into the morning, more teaching. You talk about three or four times of teaching and instruction. And through this whole day, as we get to maybe the middle part of the day of the last great day in chapter 9, we see the healing of the blind man. Verse 1, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And a lot of the parallels of the last great day of God opening up the eyes of all to see his truth. We see this physical blindness from birth. Later on we'll see, we won't look at this whole chapter, but his parents say, well, he's of age, so you can ask him. So, you know, he could have been in his 20s, maybe even 30s. Right? At least he was old enough to speak for himself. Blind since birth. We see one of those preconceived ideas is mentioned here, and this is from his disciples. Verse 2. What's also interesting is they're talking right beside him or near him. Seems to be within earshot. He doesn't speak up and protest. Imagine saying this right next to this guy who's been blind his whole life. Probably they knew him. Uh, been there quite a long time. And his disciples asked him, asked Christ, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Imagine being the blind person. This was a preconceived idea of the day. It can even be one we see in our world today, even in the church. Well, you know, they're going through this. They must have sinned. Well, and if it wasn't them, then probably their parents, and so they're reaping the consequences. Not all health difficulties are sin. Here is this one that was something, well, he had to have sinned or his parents. 
think of also this individual being there and hearing Christ's word. You think this didn't lift his spirits? Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Christ continues to point to the Father. It wasn't so my works can be seen. No, he says, so the works of God should be revealed in him. So it's going to be another mighty miracle of God through Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Already mentioning or pointing to when Christ's crucifixion would be. He just said during the day is when you work. During the day is when it was safe. During the night has more reference to even in time events, trouble, difficulties. You see maybe that more of a reference to when Christ would be crucified, when that day would end. Verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am a light. I am the light of the world. Another interesting study, especially in John, how many times the light of the world is referenced with Jesus Christ, showing God's ways. I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, and made clay with the saliva. Don't forget, this is the Sabbath. So now we got farming taking place. He spit, he's plowed ground, and now he's bringing up dirt. Oh, all the farm work that's being done. I mean, harvesting the Lord. I say it tongue-in-cheek, hopefully. <clears throat> but he picked it. He could have easily just said, see, you can see now. He did it for a reason. You see as well, is this going against these man-made traditions? And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. He still hasn't seen Christ. It's also an interesting part of this miracle. And so he comes back, very similar to the man for 38 years, not able to having this infirmity. Here's someone blind since birth. Christ says, it. well, and now for, you know, at least a month, you need to have patches on your eyes. You're not going to be used to the sensitivity of the light. It will take a while. Your eyes, your brain hasn't functioned yet to fit with your eyes. There's no instructions. Go wash it off, and you're going to see. He goes there and comes back seeing. Verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind. Here's, you think this word didn't spread? You think of how many years, if maybe it's even 17 or 18, if they classified it 18, he's an adult. All right, so 18 to 20, somewhere in there maybe, the lowest possible how long he's been blind. For every year you went up to keep the feast, you'd, oh, well, there's so-and-so, oh, that, he's been blind since birth. We have a little money to chip in to help him out. Think about how many people remember him. Oh, he was well known. The neighbors saw it. And they're saying, is this the blind guy? Is this he who sat and begged? For how many years this went by? Verse 9, some said, this is he. Others said, there's always the mixed multitude. Others said, he is like him. Maybe it's his twin. It just looks a lot like him, but it's not the same guy. Couldn't be. No one can heal the eyes like that. Couldn't be. He is like him. I love how he speaks up here. Different than the other man from 38 years of infirmity. He speaks up. He says, I am he. Wants to end the debate. No, it's me. He starts to give that credit to where it was. Verse 10, therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Shiloh and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? Where is the excitement again? Oh, wow, this is a mighty miracle. Where is this guy so we can thank him? No, where is this guy? He's guilty. First of all, it's on the Sabbath. 
And how dare you go around us? Whatever other reasons they're upset for. Then they said to him, where is he? He says, I do not know. He wasn't there. He went there to wash the, wash the clay out of his eyes and came back. Verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath. Again, this last great day still, when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. They're furious. I'm not going to go through the rest of this chapter. But again, this mighty example of God's power through Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees, not pleased. You've gone against our man-made traditions. How dare you? These are more important than God's laws. Where's the excitement? This should have been one of the happiest days of this man's life. Later in the day, or later hours away, he gets thrown out of the temple, excommunicated. His parents get drug in, or we didn't, we weren't even here. You think about the parents' excitement. Our son can see again. Instead, they get brought through the ring. Well, how did he get healed? We don't care. He was healed. And the, again, the thankfulness went to Christ and God performing the miracle through him. And I love how the end of this chapter goes through where Christ had to know what he was going through. And he goes up and gives him encouragement, finds him. And it's like ah, the encouragement of seeing Christ for the first time after that healing takes place. The sixth example of this healing of the blind man. We see many things that cross over. You think of the power over time again. It's all this time since his birth that he wasn't able to see. But also you think of the power over misfortune. The power over misfortune, which, well, he was blind this way, born. But it was specifically so this miracle would take place. 18, 20, however many years it went by. It never tells how old this individual was. But it's something that God, you know, here's why he'll be people all of his life. Well, he either sinned or his parents sinned. And it finally took this last great day for Christ to say neither of them sinned. This is going to be so you can see that glory of God. And this reminder of what took place. So that the works of God should be revealed in him. The works of God that again would show, here is my son, Jesus Christ. Here is where you need to be looking. Instead of the Jews, oh, how dare he break our man-made traditions. Not pointing to God at all. This healing again of this blind man, of this sixth example. The seventh of these one we'll look at probably a little bit more than the others because it's a lengthier one. You see in chapter 11, <clears throat> I also love all the instruction between each of these examples of God's power through Christ. Because Christ goes through more of the instruction, what, why certain things took place and where the glory is to go. You see as you get to chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 1, Chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. Here we get to Bethany. It's a suburb of Jerusalem. When we get to verse 18, it will tell us even specifically. It's two miles away. You think, well, two miles. We'll get in the car. Two miles was nothing back then. You think of how much they were walking everywhere. Two miles would have, I don't know, not even an hour Think about how quick they would get there. Uh, we think of two miles away. Here we get to this seventh one of raising of Lazarus. As he gets to this area where Lazarus was, or where he was, verse 12, or 2, I'm sorry, verse 2, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters went to him, went to Christ, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Both Mary and Martha went. You think of how many times have they seen him heal people after people. Here's someone that you know well. Can you please heal him? Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death 
but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be gloried, glorified through it. And it was for the glory of God, and it was again to show this is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Through it, verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I wonder if the, the rumor is starting to go around, if God inspired John, well, well, he didn't really love that family that much. You start looking at these phrases that are put in there. He cared for this family. Verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Two more days. Someone who's on their deathbed, not doing well, it can be an eternity. Verse 7, then all this, uh, then after this, he said to the disciples, go, uh, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? You know, it's a death sentence. We can't go back there. They're ready to stone you. They probably still got stones in their hand. Uh, we can't go back there. Verse 9, Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. Here again comes back to the nighttime and the daytime. See verse 10, but if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. It's 12 hours of daytime, 12 hours of nighttime. Uh, this reference to, you know, maybe getting to the end of the daytime. It wasn't much longer before Christ's crucifixion would take place. It wasn't over though. It was still daytime when that light should still of the world should shine and be in that example. Verse 11, these things he said and afterwards, but he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. It's a mystery he was holding back. It was also interesting how Christ viewed things, much as what we should. You know, yeah, when someone dies, they are asleep, and they will be resurrected in their time. This reminder of them, him being asleep here, and Mary has to explain, no, he's dead. Maybe it didn't even dawn on the disciples. How could this guy die? This was a close friend. Verse 15, we see the reason as it continues. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe, talking to his disciples. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. This end of verse 16 may be more of a smart aleck remark. As you think of Thomas, and here's, they've already, they're trying to kill us, and Christ, no, we're going back in. All right, let's just all go back there and die with them. Um, we think of it as they go back, and as it continues, verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Two, four days will be mentioned twice here, <clears throat> and how long it had taken place. I find it interesting Again, Christ was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Is that where we're limited to time? Well, God can only resurrect someone after three days. Here's one that's four days. And we see others that are lengthier, and we see that seventh trump. Uh, many that have been in the ground for uh, many years. Here, four days is mentioned, verse 18. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Not all of these faithful Jews will see some of them are. As with so many instances, there is a mixed multitude. It may have been those Jews that, well, I, we know you guys have been good friends with Jesus, but he's not even here. He let your brother die. How can you really trust him? You need to keep looking to us. See this mixed multitude continue. They weren't all there to comfort. Verse 20, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. 
Mary wasn't even there. We'll see he's still a ways away. The messenger comes. He's, he's on his way. So Martha goes out to find him first. But Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I have to wonder if in the back of Martha and Mary's mind, it's, the phrase gets repeated at least three times. If we've seen you heal people left and right, what took so long? He's already dead. If you just would have been here. But it's interesting, you also don't see any bitterness. You don't, we're not following you anymore. We thought that you would do this for us. They just make the statement, I, I thought you could, we were gonna, you could heal. You would have been here in time. Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Pointing ultimately to that seventh trump, but also to the resurrections to come. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Here is that seventh trump. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. Already an understanding of who Christ was and also already pointing to his second coming, that he would come again. Verse 28, And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly. Mary, we see, was not pouting. She was grieving a different way. And as soon as she heard Christ ask for her, she got up quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Still not in a hurry. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You think the Jews were happy to see her fall down before his feet? She'd be falling down before our feet. We're the ones that have been comforting you this whole time. Verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Think of this emphasis of yearning to have people of faith. There was doubt here. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. See, Jesus did not weep because he was missing Lazarus. Jesus wept because of the lack of faith. They still weren't getting it. This weeping because of this lack of faith. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man, so here's the third time it gets repeated, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? So he must be limited in power. He's really not that prophet that we're still looking for. These accusations that were there, and we see just a simple statement from Mary and Martha. If you've just been here, we've seen it over and over. Verse 38, then Jesus again groaned in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Christ gives instructions. Christ could have moved the stone instantly. He could, we'll get rid of this. Instead, he gives the simple instructions. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who had, was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been <coughs> dead four days. Second time we see this, verse 17, and here in verse 39, mentioning he's been dead four days. He's stinking up the place. You don't want to open this up. He's sealed. Jesus said to her, 
Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Still not pointing to himself. You're going to see the glory of God. Did I not say believe, have faith? I love how she does it. Well, let me think about this for a while. They moved the stone, verse 41, and they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So far, no record of Christ even saying anything. Did he pray it silently? He already knew God would answer what he prayed. And he gives him thanks. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Christ is always giving credit to the Father. He keeps giving that credit to the Father. Verse 42, and I know that you always hear me. But because the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Christ had no lack of faith. He knew God, the Father was going to hear him instantly. But it was for those others to hear that the Father was answering his prayer and he was the one who was going to raise him up out of the, out of the, out of the cave. Now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, we think of the simple words that are there. He thanks God for his resurrection before he even says, Lazarus, come out. Interesting, he doesn't. Well, let's go carry him out, bring him out. Look at Elisha as an example. Uh, God healing and bringing back the child who had died. It was three or four times I think he went up to the upper room. Here we see with Jesus Christ, one time, Lazarus, come forth. And maybe some of the plot of the old mummy movies. I'd love to see this one again because you picture here's this guy buried in. In burial cloths. And he said, verse 4, And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. <laughs> you picture Lazarus coming out. He says, oh, drop all those things. He's coming out and crying. I can't talk. I've got something over my mouth. And, you think about Lazarus being awakened and still not being able to see because you got whether you can see anything out of the grave cloth on his face and you hear if you recognize Christ's voice of Lazarus come out well, I'm going to listen but I can't move and you picture him kind of waddling out and them taking him off and he's alive quite an example verse 45 then many of the Jews you wish that said all of the Jews. It doesn't. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. We know it's not all as they would then start to plot to kill Jesus from this point on. The Pharisees, you think of even as it gets into chapter 12, verse 10. But the chief priests took counsel that they might also put Lazarus to death. Where's the excitement from the religious leaders? Wow, here he resurrected a guy four days in the tomb. Wow, maybe we should just swallow our pride and be pointing to him instead of ourselves. We think of Mary and Martha, their excitement as they see their brother coming out. And how within a short matter of time, whether this is a few days away that goes by, that now they're worried they're going to try to kill him again. They're going to try to kill him because word is spreading that Christ resurrected him. So what's the best way? you got fake news. We'll, we'll go ahead and kill him and say, well, he never was resurrected to begin with. And he, here's his body. They would try, but they didn't succeed. But you think again about it should have been one of the most joyous days in their life. Within... So many days later, they're trying to kill Lazarus and put him to death again. We think of this mighty miracle, this, again, seventh of these uh, examples of God's power through Jesus Christ. The raising of Lazarus. Power over death. Power over death. 
this reminder as we'll point to the resurrection of Jesus Christ or that reminder that all will have their chance to be resurrected. God has power over death, even after four days in the tomb. Leads us to the eighth of these ten. See, in chapter 18, there's so much instruction. Then in chapter 12, 13, you get the verses we read in Passover, Christ washing their feet, and all the instruction through chapters leading up to chapter 18. And then you get to the betrayal and arrest in Gethsemane. Here was, uh, we get to this eighth one where the troops fall. I think we went over this one briefly during Peter's, uh, the sermon on Peter. The section here is Judas would betray him. And you think about one of those 12 being there to betray him. He blended in with everybody. Again, he wasn't, didn't have the sign. I'm the son of God. Look at me. I, I'm important. Didn't have long hair. We went to Ezekiel a few weeks ago. It talks about it. priests had well-trimmed hair. Wasn't someone who stood out. You see, as they're looking for him, and Judas betrays him with the kiss. We see dropping down here in chapter 18 and verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? You see this detachment of troops that are mentioned in verse 13. We went through this uh, prior on Passover last year. This was at least 200 troops. As you look at all the people there, well over 200, but at least 200 with the troops alone. They're all in their battle array. They're ready for action. They are there to fight if needed, to arrest this individual. And you think of these individuals who were muscular, they're strong, they've got, oh, you're not gonna knock us over with a little gust of wind. It took a little less than that. As Christ says, who are you seeking? Verse five, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with them, with the 200 or more. Then when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Talk about these big bad troops. <laughs> fell back on their butts. You picture them even getting up. Probably hard getting up with all their armor on. And, oh, I'm a big guy. How did I just get knocked over? Maybe also the drawing back and falling backwards also in the Bible is a sign of demonism. So... Satan had his troops there. They had nothing on God or his son. And as Christ replied, I'm he. Does it three times. Each time, they fall over. And again, I love the humor of God. Now you're going to get my son, but let's show you where the power really is. The troops fall. And this reminder again, over and over here, three times, <clears throat> fulfill prophecy that took place but these troops fall we think of this power over quote unquote strength you think about 200 people coming to your front door you're under arrest you're, there's no way you're going to get out of this can God protect power over strength and as you look at this example power over demons even as 200 came in they were allowed finally because Prophecy had to be fulfilled. Christ had to give his life. But God, again, having that power over this quote-unquote strength that was so formidable here of at least 200 men. Leads us to the ninth one of these. That's the longest, but the one we'll spend the least amount of time. We often go over this through Passover in the days of unleavened bread like we did this past year. <clears throat> this ninth one, Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection. After three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Jesus Christ did not resurrect himself. Plenty of places have mentioned the Father raised up his Son. This reminder, again, is the Trinity as a doctrine of demons that, well, how do you explain it? You cannot explain it. Christ was dead in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Well, if he's part of the Trinity, he's, the Father's up here. We're, 
where he couldn't have really died. He, he died. The Father resurrected him. There is no Trinity. We think of this power of God to resurrect his son, Jesus Christ. And as you get into chapter 20, I think we went through this right after the feast, after unleavened bread as well. We think of this power over death, similar to what we saw with Lazarus, but this one much more powerful. Powerful over death and power over Satan. Satan had nothing on Jesus Christ. You think of in the empty tomb, when Christ was resurrected, was actually on the Sabbath, Saturday evening before sunset. And as they came to see him in the early morning hours, could have been late Saturday night after sunset, when technically it's Sunday. And then in the Sunday morning, when they finally came back, and he sees Mary Magdalene here, and we see this reference, one of my favorite verses, because it kind of harkens back in chapter 20, to what we saw him say to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And here we see him remember it again. Chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. This reminder, here's the Father. He's my Father. And Christ's resurrection, the first of the first fruits, he can now be your Father. You've got to continue on. You've got to endure to the end. And that seventh trump, that resurrection into God's family. This reminder, though, that it's now. My Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Some of my favorite verses, as you think of this encouragement of Mary, who's ready to hug him, and he's like, no, he keeps pointing to the Father. I'm going up to see my Father, and he's your Father. I'm going up to see my God, and he's your God. This revelation, as he would show uh, by coming back, and uh, later on he's able to be touched because he's already ascended to the Father and came back, showing himself to the disciples, we think of Christ's resurrection and this power over death, over Satan. Finally, at that time and that reminder of what this picture is, the first of the first fruits, leads us to the tenth and final of these that occurs then after this resurrection. The tenth one, as you start thinking of each of these, and you think, multitude of fish. Really, is it that important? You really start thinking, what was all involved in this uh, last of these examples of God's power through Christ here in the book of John? We get to chapter 21. <clears throat> you think of all that the disciples have been through, especially as I think of Peter denying Christ three times. He said, I will stand up to you till I die. And Christ says, no, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, I'll never deny, even if I have to be crucified right beside you. And Christ showed him, picture the look that he gave him when he actually did it. You think those weren't some tough days afterwards? Hearing Christ's resurrection, the excitement. And here as we see in chapter 21, verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, to the other ten, him being the eleventh, I am going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Several of these were fishermen by trade before their calling. Fishing at night was when it was normally done, was when the fish were biting. And so they didn't catch anything. Now we can't even catch fish right again. Uh, it's like it's just one thing after the other. Verse 4, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They said, and they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You talk about in other miracles. Not just a few. Oh, well, yeah, we got a few. Well, we just should have tried the other side of the boat. 
Well, again, a mighty miracle. Therefore, verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved, reference again to John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Picture all that Peter had been going through. He is not concerned one bit about the fish. He's going to Jesus Christ. Probably has a lot on his mind. Plunges into the sea, verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat. For they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits. About 100 yards. Dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. And fish laid on it and bread. Christ didn't need for them to catch anymore. He already had a meal prepared for them. They were out all night. His immediate thought is they're hungry going to have something to eat and we're going to talk so he has it ready for them all prepared Jesus said to them bring some of the fish which you have just caught we'll cook some of them as well Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land so you picture Peter coming up to Christ and Christ giving specific instructions go bring the fish Peter no no I want to talk to you first he just boom I'll go get the fish goes back went and dragged the net to land full of large fish. These aren't minnows. 153. 153 large fish. And although, although there were so many, the net was not broken. So many of these miracles have miracles within themselves. They were, so many of them were fishermen. They knew this net would never hold that amount of fish. Not only did they catch all these large 153 fish, but the net didn't even break when it should have broke. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? He was a spirit being. He could still let, not let them see who he was. None of them asked, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. This kind of harkened back to the feeding of the 5,000, where they get the reminder. Oh, got another example. Verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. We think of this multitude of fish, went beyond just the fish. That yeah, was the power of nature. Again, should you look at controlling the fish to go in the net, controlling the net not to break. You think of God's power through Christ. I think one of the bigger ones that I see through this one, especially as you look at Peter, and then we're not going to go through it all, but you get into verses 15 through 19. How down was Peter? Christ spends the time encouraging him. Spend the time giving him something to eat along with the others, and they probably all needed the encouragement. They all ran when he was arrested. Not a single one stood by him. They often single out Peter as Christ then gives them the encouragement. That's right, repent. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. This reminder of, all right, the past is the past. Repent and move on. Do what I have for you to do. And you're to care for the lambs, the sheep, to do what I've given. Even if it means, as he would show later as well, that you're going to die of the crucifixion. Peter being one of those, that first and second Peter of an individual, despite knowing how he would die, stayed faithful to the end and stayed encouraged. I have to wonder how many times he went back to think about this time where Christ reveals himself and spends time with Peter, it's all right, keep at it. Yeah, you may die this way, keep at it. You're going to make it. And that encouragement that Peter gives all of us to remind us, though, keep at it. This power of encouragement, as you think of this multitude of fish, where God performed this miracle through his son to again show this power. You get to the tenth one, and it's almost, uh, well, really you're going to put fish in with all these, you know, Lazarus was resurrected, and 
And yet, how important was this last one in the book of John of this encouragement that they needed? We think of these examples that we see through the scriptures. God the Father performed many miracles through his Son. And it gets us to think, do we limit God in our life? Well, God couldn't possibly do this, or he wouldn't do this through this, or are there times we limit God? Do we think God needs help in how we worship him? We see a world getting ready for Christmas, getting ready to worship God, not how he shows to worship him. You look at all these examples of God's power, you think he needs us to add to what he's already given us. We have the Sabbath, we have all these festivals which are perfect in his plan. God doesn't need Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, throw all the list of pagan festivals in the mix. We think of, do we limit God? Well, you know, God is pretty good in most areas, but I'll show him how best I can worship him, how I will follow. We think God needs help in how we worship. We look at these ten examples of God's power through Jesus Christ. To water to wine, the healing of the nobleman's son, healing of the sick man, the feeding of the five thousand, walking on water, healing the blind man, raising of Lazarus, troops fall over, Christ's resurrection, and the multitude of fish. Each of these, again, showing God's power and how he is not limited. But we can limit him if we're not careful. We can, well, you know, God won't do this or that. We're reminded, do we limit God? Are there times in our life where, well, you know, I'm not the son of God, and so I don't really know if he would do that for me. Why wouldn't he? We think, well, you know, this is a time where we don't have as many miracles. Could be. We need miracles to see God's power. We have them written in his word to see how he did things. Do we still have that same faith of God can still do that in my life? Are we still following God? Are we still putting him first in our life? It's something, again, to remember to never forget the miracles of the Bible and what they truly show. There is nothing that limits God. We can, in our mind, we can lack faith. And so many times in examples of individuals of lacking that faith. But we are not to lack faith. We look at that power of God the Father through Jesus Christ. Do we see God's power? Don't ever limit God. 